Hello, welcome to the 2021 American Men's Studies Association Virtual Interdisciplinary Conference on Men and Masculinities hosted by the University of Washington Tacoma. My name is Jeff Cohen. I'm uh, AMSA president and a faculty member and administrator at the University of Washington Tacoma. I'm so excited to welcome you to our 2021 virtual conference. Uh, sorry that we can't be in person, um, but so looking forward to an engaging uh, thought-provoking conference uh, throughout the next few days. I'd like to start our opening ceremony and awards uh, with the University of Washington Tacoma Land Acknowledgement. We recognize that all of us at the University of Washington Tacoma learn, live, and work on or near the ancestral homeland of the Coast Salish people. In particular, we are situated on the traditional territory of the Puyallup. As people on this occupied territory, we have a responsibility to acknowledge the land, the ancestors who have cared for this land since time immemorial, and all our indigenous connections today. We also have the responsibility to acknowledge the histories of dispossession and forced removal have allowed, that have allowed for the growth and survival of this institution. In light of this history, let us take active efforts to partner with our indigenous community members and neighbors as we continue our work together as a community of learners, leaders, and educators. I also want to take a moment to thank uh, and acknowledge some folks who have played a, a pivotal role in organizing and carrying out this conference. I'd like to start with the 2020 Conference Planning Committee, uh, Cliff Leak, Paula Ermintrout, and Mark Justad, and all of the 2020 presenters uh, who worked so hard to build and craft an engaging and incredible conference lineup last year. Uh, as you know, we unfortunately had to postpone that conference. Uh, we're so glad to have been able to welcome back many of those presenters this year for the virtual conference. Uh, but I did want to acknowledge all the effort uh, and dedication that these folks put into that conference uh, and are looking forward to their continued engagement with the American Men's Studies Association. I'd also like to thank this year's conference planning committee. Uh, we have put together the first ever fully online virtual conference for the American Men's Studies Association. Uh, this has been a great deal of work. Uh, AMSA is an all-volunteer organization, uh, and so these folks, on top of all of their regular job and life, uh, and on top of all that's been going on this year, uh, have, have dedicated time and energy and effort to putting together a, a great program for us. Uh, so I want to thank Joseph Derek Nelson, Mark Justad, Robert Cerny, Kritzia Nardini, uh, for their contributions to this to this conference. I also want to thank our 2021 conference Zoom hosts, Paula Ermintrout, Jamila Del Sharp, Mark Justad, Liedrich Sherman, Joseph Der Derek Nelson, Andrea Walling, Robert Cerny, uh, for volunteering their time to host and moderate sessions throughout this conference. And last but not least, I want to thank uh, the University of Washington Tacoma Media Support Services staff, in particular Zach Curtis and Noah Kem, uh, for their support throughout this conference, uh, both with technology and also facilitating this live stream with us uh, tonight and the live stream tomorrow with our scholar and residents. Thank you so much for all your work uh, to support this conference. I'd also like to take a moment to honor and recognize uh, the incredible work and impact of Dr. David William Foster. Dr. Foster was the faculty head of Spanish and Portuguese and Regents Professor of Spanish at Arizona State University, as well as a University of Washington alumni who passed away on June 24th, 2020 at the age of 79. Dr. Foster had graciously agreed to serve as the AMSA Scholar in Residence for the 2020 conference, which as I mentioned was postponed due to the pandemic. His passing shortly after the conference was supposed to be held is a deep loss for our field and an incredible loss for the many whose lives he touched. Uh, as a small uh, 
token and illustration of our appreciation for the work of Dr. Foster uh, and to honor his indelible, indelible contributions to the critical study of men and masculinities and the mentorship he has provided to so many through the years. Uh, AMSA Vice President Dr. Jonathan Allen will engage Dr. Foster's work in his presentation entitled Rural Eroticism and Marcos Zimmerman's Desnudos Sudamericanos, uh, which will take place tomorrow from 3.30 to 5 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time USA uh, in concurrent session three in a panel titled Art and Literature. Also take a moment uh, before we begin our Q&A with our uh, esteemed keynote speaker uh, to uh, celebrate several of our award winners this year. Uh, first is the 2021 Lauren Frankel Memorial Scholarship. The Board of Directors of the American Men's Studies Association established the Lauren Frankel Student Scholarship Fund in 2005. This fund is dedicated to the memory of Dr. Lauren Frankel, a young professor of psychology at Shepherd University in Shepherdstown, West Virginia, who died tragically in an automobile accident in 2004. Dr. Frankel was known as an inspiring teacher, an accomplished scholar, and a respected colleague. He presented papers on adolescent sexuality and male heterosexual identity at AMSA's annual conferences uh, throughout the years. This scholarship fund supports students and early career professionals engaged in the critical study of men and masculinities like Dr. Frankel. This year, we're proud and excited to award four Lauren Frankel Memorial Scholarships. The first to Rod Martinez, a doctoral student in sociology at the University of Maryland College Park whose presentation entitled Men, Masculinity, and Radical Love in the American Carceral State will take place during concurrent session one on Friday, June 18th from 8 to 9.30 a.m. in a session entitled Imprisoned Masculinities. The second award winner, Kelly O'Donnell, is a third year PhD student in Communication Studies and Rhetoric at the University of Pittsburgh. Their presentation entitled In Cells, Dark Cells, and Intervention will take place in concurrent session three on Friday, June 18th from 3.30 to 5 p.m. in a session entitled Incels and the Alt-Right. Our third awardee, Vic Overdorf, is a PhD candidate in gender studies at Indiana University Bloomington. Their presentation entitled Unmasculinities Incarcerated, Gay Male Prisoners at Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary will take place during concurrent session one on Friday, June 18th from 8 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. in a session entitled Imprisoned Masculinities. And finally, our fourth award winner, Duru Basak Gurlu, is a graduate student in cultural studies and media at Hecatep University. Their presentation, Even I Do Not Go There, How Do You Dare?, Hindrances of being a woman researcher and researching masculinities during times of pandemic hit will take place during concurrent session one on Friday, June 18th from 8 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. in a session entitled COVID-19. Please join me uh, to the extent that you can in celebrating our 2021 Lauren Frankel Memorial Scholarship winners. I'd also like to announce our 2021 AMSA Best Paper Award winner. AMSA's Best Paper Award showcases the high quality of papers presented at the 2021 Interdisciplinary Conference on Men and Masculinities. This year's winner, Ian Funk, is a doctoral candidate in English at George Washington University in Washington, DC. His work focuses on iterations of modern American masculinities. He's currently working on his dissertation which attempts a genealogy of crip queer masculinity in cultural production from the end of reconstruction to the current moment. Is their paper entitled America's Disabled Masculinity, Roosevelt, Remington, Worcester, and the Disappearance of the Neurasthenic Cowboy as Traditional Masculinity will, will be presented during concurrent session three on Friday, June 18th from 3.30 p.m. To 5 p.m. in a session entitled Disability. 
in just uh, about 15 minutes, we will be joined by our esteemed uh, keynote lecturer, Dr. Miriam Abelson. Before then, I'd like to take a few moments to talk about some initiatives that AMSA is working on uh, in the coming year. The first is that we'll be seeking uh, and exploring an institutional partnership with a university in, in the United States to help expand our infrastructure uh, and create some more sustainable engagement with members uh, and with the critical field of critical studies uh, in metamasculinities uh, for years to come. The second, we will be deepening and expanding our mentoring and professional development uh, programming for students and early career and mid-career professionals with a particular focus on uh, folks in those spaces, as well as those who have been traditionally marginalized and silenced in the field of men's studies. Uh, we launched our 2021 mentorship pilot program this year. Uh, we have three uh, mentees who have been assigned mentors uh, as uh, members of our board as mentors. Uh, and they're working on mentorship plans uh, that orient around things like publishing, transitioning into higher education, uh, CV development, research, uh, theoretical exploration, um, and networking. We're really excited for this pilot project uh, and are looking forward to expanding this uh, opportunity to members uh, in the coming years. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to take a moment to introduce our keynote speaker. So the American Men's Studies Sam, Sam Femiano Endowed Lecture in Men's Studies uh, is dedicated to Sam Femiano, who was a founding member of AMSA and a mentor and friend to the board and to those entering the field of men's studies. As a therapist, Sam was a passionate supporter of developing a critical social discourse on men and masculinity. He served two terms as AMSA president and two terms as AMSA treasurer and secretary. He also held a seat as an elected member of the AMSA board of directors from 1991 to 2009. Sam contributed immeasurably to the development of AMSA and to its efforts to develop and sustain the critical study of men and masculinities in a rigorous, open-minded, inclusive and mutually supportive manner. The Sam Femiano Men's Studies Lecture Fund is an endowment created to support an invited men's studies plenary lecture each year at AMSA's annual conference. The invited speaker selected by the AMSA president in consultation with the conference planning committee is chosen because they are a scholar, teacher, author, clinician or practitioner whose work contributes substantially to the field of men's studies. I'm sure you will find that this year's speaker lives up to that billing. For this year's Femiano Lecture in Men's Studies, we welcome Dr. Miriam Abelson, whose engaging and thought-provoking talk entitled Transitioning Men and Transforming Critical Masculinities was made available to you for viewing prior to this Q&A. Dr. Abelson is an Associate Professor of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at Portland State University. Her research focuses on masculinities, transgender studies, LGBT youth, rural and urban studies, and intersectional approaches to race, sexuality, and gender. She has published on topics including masculinities and violence, transfeminism, and intersectionality and gendered fear. Her stellar book entitled Men in Place, Transmasculinity, Race and Sexuality in America, published in 2019, demonstrates through a large and geographically diverse interview study with transgender men that contemporary US masculinity is deeply embedded in the spaces and places men move in their everyday lives and is inseparable from race and sexuality. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Abelson to this conversation. So we're really excited to have you here, Dr. Abelson, and I, I was hoping we could start with uh, a question that speaks to a, a comment you made in your talk and, and really reflects and models uh, the kinds of reflexivity uh, 
uh, that are so critical in the types of research that we do. And so you mentioned in your address that you weren't sure if you were the right person to do the research associated with your book. I was wondering if you wanted to take a few moments to expand on your thinking there. Thanks for that question, Jeff, and the great introduction. And you know, it's really um, an honor to be give, to uh, give the Sam Femiano lecture with that great history of it, and um, just to just join the the conference. I really appreciate all the work that you've done, um, and everyone else to organize the conference. So, um, so why you know why am I hesitant to say that I'm the, the sort of right person still? Um, to have done this research, to publish this book. Um, you know, and a lot of that came from the sort of feminist politics of representation that I was trained in. Um, and thinking as a queer, gender nonconforming woman, um, you know, but not as a trans man myself, um, you know, was it sort of okay for me to, to do this research, to continue the project? I sort of hemmed and hawed at every, um, possible opportunity to do so, whether I should, <laughs> and if anyone wants advice about that, um, about uh, <laughs> that kind of having and hawing, I'm happy to give that as well. Um, you know, I started off um, with this project thinking that this is a group that's very, I talked about this a little bit, I think in the talk, that this is a group that's really um, close to me, socially still is, socially, politically, um, and I think that the calls, you know, when I when I first started doing this work, as I mentioned, there wasn't really a lot about trans men. Um, and so initially I felt like, okay, I'm kind of well situated. This is something that's close to me, et cetera. Um, and then I think more and more every year, even since then, I think the calls for um, being really mindful about non-trans people producing knowledge about trans people have become stronger, which I think is really great, right? And we can take the, the idea from the disability justice or disability rights movement, like nothing about us without us, right? And um, so that really gave me pause throughout, probably even, um, you know, agreeing to do this keynote address. I'm sure that that's something that was a while ago now, but I'm sure that's something that um, entered my mind. So one of the, the reasons I decided to go ahead of, with it is, um, you know, I had started doing this work and I started encountering other people doing similar kinds of work. Um, and I found that uh, some of them weren't doing that same kind, uh, didn't have that same hesitancy that I did, um, which worried me quite a bit. Um, you know, I realized that these sort of nine questions that I had about representation um, might mean that I would be more likely to do the work in a mindful way, in a way that really did justice to um, the trans men that's, that agreed to speak with me. There also came to a point, um, you know, and, and again, that's along with my kind of critical, my commitment to critical trans politics. I feel like that was something that was really important. Um, in the end, as I continued to do the work, um, the resolution I came to, especially around the time that I was finishing the book, was that these 66 men had agreed to share their stories with me. Um, and that we'll talk about this more, I think, later, but that they wanted me to varying degrees to get these stories out in the world. And so regardless of those larger um, commitments and ideas, my commitment was really to these specific men um, and to continue doing that work. And I think that, um, you know, to, to sort of shutter the project would be a waste of their time um, and their energies in participating. Um, and, you know, some of the men that I interviewed uh, were and are writers, activists, scholars of their own right. And so they're able to get their words out there in other ways. But many of the men I interviewed were really everyday men and don't have access to some of the spaces that I might. Um, the other piece of this, and I write about it um, in the book, I think in the methodological appendix quite a bit, is that a lot of the issues of power and representation that I was really focused on at first, right? So this sort of trans, non-trans idea between myself and the men that I interviewed, and also the sort of basic researcher interviewee difference. Um, 
you know, those are really central in my mind. Now, of course, when I actually got into the interview settings, the relationships between myself and the interviewees were much more complicated, right? I was a white person, a middle-class person. I was a woman interviewing men, um, you know, and all of these things became so much more complicated. Um, and I think really opened up possibilities for um, communicating across sameness, right? Uh, there were moments where I would show up to interview someone and we would go, oh, hey, I recognize you from around, right? So there were those kinds of community connections as well. Um, and, you know, the other thing that I write about is that, um, yeah, so those connections allowed and differences allowed more to come out of uh, uh, the interviews, both, you know, things that I could use for analysis, but also I think the that sort of relational space of the interview and the, the things that can be produced um, out of that for each person just as, as kind of human beings. Um, and the last thing I'll say about that is that, um, you know, I started off these, the, these interviews and one of, you know, I'd ask people, um, well, why, you know, why, why did you, where did you hear about this? What made you want to um, participate? And I kept getting this thing of, um, I was just so curious, like, what is this person from Oregon doing in the, in the Bay Area, in the South, in the Midwest? And the, you know, when I would get that question, I would just think, I'm not a person from Oregon, you know, I'm from California, right? And now that I've lived in Oregon for a number of years, I feel less like a, more like an Oregonian. Some people would quibble with that probably, especially as a former Californian. Um, but what I, you know, what that made me realize is the ways that the, um, you know, that the doing the research really changed me. Um, they changed the way I thought about myself, didn't change my basic identities, but um, my understandings, my political commitments, and even a little bit of like where I'm from, you know. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, I have some, some follow-ups to that that we'll explore as we go forward, but I, I really uh, want to take a moment to appreciate how you're speaking to both the need to um, honor and center and amplify the voices of those who you interviewed, right? Those who, in mm -hmm. their own right, whether they're, uh, you know, published or academics or, or not, uh, are social historians, right? And speaking through their own lived experiences and, and how to balance that with your capacity to access spaces and amplify those voices in settings that they may not have access to, right? And, and in some ways, mm -hmm. Uh, potentially vice versa, right? Uh, them being able to amplify the voices of others who participate in your research uh, in their spaces that, that you may not have access to. Um, so I really do appreciate that. And we'll come back to some of those dynamics in, in just a moment. Yeah. Uh, I want to take a moment to remind our audience that you can submit questions uh, for Dr. Abelson at conferenceamsa at gmail.com at any time. And we are uh, monitoring that email and we'll, we'll do our best to, to incorporate those questions into this Q&A. Um, and actually this first follow-up, uh, I think touches on some of that struggle that you spoke to uh, and comes from one of the uh, attendees who, who submitted this question. So I'm gonna read it uh, from the first person voice in which it was written. Um, and so just know that the, the I in this question is not necessarily me, although it, it may actually apply. Um, so uh, I am a cisgender heterosexual white man who studies various topics related to gender and sexualities, including the experiences of sexual and gender minority persons. I am often told by my queer colleagues that my contribution is a valuable one. However, sometimes I feel that I can never know what it is really like to walk in the shoes of my participants. My question is this, to what extent do you think that allies are important in the field of gender and sexuality? Do you feel that we should limit our research to those experiences that we know more intimately or our, or our contributions from, quote, outsiders valuable? Moreover, in what ways do our personal experiences both assist and hamper our abilities to study groups, which we are an insider-outsider to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and thanks for that, that question from the audience. Um, you know, it was interesting early on when I, uh, I guess throughout when I, you know, I did the recruitment for this research over about um, three or four years. And 
the, some of the language may have changed on my flyers and, and what have you, but one of the things I was always a little hesitant to use was the word ally, to say, you know, when I was sort of explaining who I am to gatekeepers or anyone else, um, because there's there's like a little bit of a taint to that word, right? Um, well, what do you mean you're an ally? Um, and there, you know, we, and many of us, I'm sure, are familiar with conversations about like ally versus accomplice or or other uh, other ways of rethinking that relationship. Um, but you know, and I'm not going to go too much into all of that. But I think that that question is so important because, um, you know, if we only do work on those that we think are like ourselves, mm -hmm. um, that really limits, of course. Um, the knowledge that's produced, um, it really limits, um, you know, in so many uh, fundamental ways. You know, it also, I think, and this was part of my own calculus at moments of uh, thinking about if I am more privileged in particular ways, how might I, util and I, and I really want to utilize that privilege in a critical way, how might I do that um, through working with um, communities that are not my own? Um, so I found that, you know, I couldn't, I didn't use that word ally, but I would try to signal that I was an ally, um, through the language that I used, through the conversations that I had, through being willing to, you know, I remember one person who acted as sort of a gatekeeper to a community, um, in the Southeast, you know, we had a two hour phone conversation, um, before he would allow me to, you know, to agree to, to help set up some interviews and then still like met me at a gas station to sort of check me out. And I had to follow him to the place, you know, to, which is fine. Like, who is that? Who is this person from Oregon? Right. Um, and, you know, so, I, so I, th I think that ally is most useful when we think of it as an unstable category, right. As something that we're, that, we're striving toward um, that that we're very aware of. So, and and to answer clearly that basic question of, do I think that people can you know straight cis people can do um, work on gender and sexual minorities on LGBTQ plus people? Yes, sometimes, right. But I think again, it's that kind of critical reflection um, that is really necessary, even more so when we. Um, try to create knowledge about groups that are not our own. Um, and, you know, again, and well, and I'll also say that, you know, we should have some of that critical lens when we make assumptions that we can study the groups that we think we're a part of too. Um, but particularly for, for this kind of work, I would say the questions I might ask myself um, are, you know, am I drawing on not only my doing interviews or surveys or focus groups or what have you, um, with that group, but how am I incorporating and relying on the knowledge that's been created by that group? So in academic spaces and activist spaces, am I really doing the work, um, you know, not just to sort of study people, but to understand their own knowledge production um, that comes through all of those venues? Um, have I really done the homework? But then also at the same time to approach it with humility, of course, right? I'm not the first person um, that said something like that. Um, you know, I think that's partially about um, doing things carefully um, is, is having that humility as being, you know, doing a deeper kind of listening than we might do. And, you know, one of the things about um, that I think I was able to do in the book and, you know, I've heard good things from people. If anyone has quibbles with it, feel free to email me. I'd love to hear it. Um, either way. But um, there's something about, you know, doing interviews with 66 trans men and being able to um, recreate some of the conversations that are happening within communities um, through, you know, those multiple voices. And I think that's a really key thing to do of to figure out where your political commitments are, um, you know, and find some alignment within those communities, but also to have an openness to these larger dialogues that are happening um, within the community. I think there's also, and again, you know, I think there's a lot of discussion about this, that when we're doing this work, um, you know, as an ally, we want to think about the material considerations of it. Um, so, 
you know, have I materially benefited from doing this work in various ways? Absolutely, you know, um, you know, all kinds of ways. Um, but, you know, I also am really um, conscientious about the kinds of opportunities that are offered to me that I um, am probably not the best person to do. So, for example, I don't do trans 101 um, presentations. Uh, I can do them, you know, um, but I have the knowledge to do them. But um, there are, you know, many people um, who, trans people who have that knowledge and who have, you know, careers or, or aspiring to careers where that's part of their work. And so some of that is is directing um, that attention and that work that way. Um, I'll also mentor and give opportunities to students that are interested in that kind of work. Um, so thinking about how is it beneficial for them to come into a classroom or, you know, I'll give the example of my, where I get my hair cut, my barber, who's my good friend, was looking for someone to do some education around um, trans issues, non-binary issues, and pronouns, and um, it didn't happen because of the pandemic, but I was able to connect them with one of my students who had expressed interest in, you know, in doing that work moving forward. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think those are the key considerations when entering into that, and, um, you know, I also, for myself, I'm just okay with, like, being beat up a little bit sometimes, um, not being a you know victim about it all the time, right? But um, you know, getting a little flack, getting some mistrust, which I certainly get in all kinds of you know research that I do. Um, yeah, I'll, let me add one more thing before I wrap up because I'll just go on and on about this question. But I think even about some research I'm doing in um, rural areas in uh, Idaho and Eastern Washington, um, a project that I just wrapped up. And which is true for the project with trans men as well, of really talking to the people and seeing like, wh where do I enter this? What's been done already? You know, so for, with trans men, I wasn't really focused, although it came up, I was focused on trans men's lives as men, not on necessarily on childhood experiences or something like that, because that had already been done in the literature. And it also sort of reproduces some of these psychological and medical narratives of trans people. So again, I would think, you know, where, where's that, or, you know, talking to people in, in rural Idaho and Eastern Washington and sort of saying like, I'm not sure if, if I should do this work and hearing enough voices saying like, yes, please, we need help. Um, no one cares about us. That's what a few people said to me. And here are the things that you can, that would make that actually helpful to us. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm really impressed. It came through in, um, your recorded presentation and it's coming through again here in your responses. And, and one of the, the through lines that I'm seeing is this real um, commitment to um, sort of self criticality and understanding yourself in those spaces um, and how that interacts. Right? And, and I'm thinking about the spaces. We'll, I'll ask a question in a moment about uh, yeah. I think you spoke to how that shows up in spaces where you're presenting your work and talking about your work. It shows up in the spaces uh, in which the work is happening and the interviews you're doing. Um, and I think uh, we'll get to this a little bit later, but really appreciate the conversation around how this shows up uh, in how you understand yourself as an educator, as a teacher uh, in the classroom. And so I really appreciate um, as someone who uh, does similarly qualitative work to, to be thinking about the self in relation to uh, those and others, but also to the spaces. Which I think is a contribution that you make here that, that is really important. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So I'm going to ask this question. You, you touched on it a bit already, so feel free to, to simply say, I'm good. Uh, so, uh, you know, you mentioned in your uh, talk that one thing you learned through talking to people about your research and the stories of trans men that you interviewed was that you uh, were operating with a particular knowledge of gender and that both your own gender knowledge as well as the knowledge of the people asking questions are spatially specific. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you might um, kind of tease that out a little bit more and, and, and talk a little bit more about that connection between uh, those gender knowledges, your own and others, and how they are spatially specific. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the point that, um, that I allude to 
here and there, and I haven't spoken to yet in this conversation is, you know, I came from the San Francisco Bay Area, from these very sort of radical queer and trans communities, um, and, you know, that that reflected a, an ex, that expansive gender knowledge, as I name it. And, you know, there's a real sort of superior feeling, I think, a lot of times to that knowledge. Like, oh, we figured it out. We're the most radical. That's the right way to be. This is what's, and there's a good intention behind it. This is what's going to create justice, make more livable lives for people. And, you know, I mean, I, I knew better. I'm a, a, a hopefully a polite enough person to um, to not show that, right, when I'm asking questions or, or, or doing that kind of thing in an interview. Um, you know, but it was really striking to me the I think that, you know, the ways that, particularly in rural spaces, but I think this happens in, in all kinds of spaces that this consider, and as I said in the address, you know, it's this way of conceiving of rural spaces as backwards, as ignorant, as in need of urban people to come and fix them. And, you know, that's really a colonial mentality, right? Um, these people aren't able to govern themselves. Um, they need someone to come in and save them. And, and, and set things right. Now, that doesn't mean that these those more restrictive knowledges don't harm people. And so I think that, um, you know, and I certainly encountered um, men that I interviewed that I like disagreed with things they said, although that was maybe across urban, rural and suburban spaces. Um, and they were they were a minority of the, the people I interviewed. Um, but, by recognizing my own knowledge, and maybe we might talk about this later when we talk a little bit more about teaching, but recognizing my own knowledge and that it was that my own taken for granted assumptions, I think allowed me to produce something, to understand where others were coming from and to produce something that was really different if I had kept that sort of metronormative, um, urban-centered centered, um narratives. And I think, again, the solutions, I'll probably repeat this about five times, um, but that the solutions to making, bettering people's lives come from those local knowledges, you know, maybe, maybe shifts need to happen in them, but they have to be shifts that, that are relevant to that place and to those people, the histories and the culture of them. Great. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll come back to some of what you spoke to there in terms of engaging uh, sort of within and across uh, degrees of gender knowledge and, and how those uh, how that plays out uh, in just a moment. Um, just a reminder for the audience, we are uh, receiving questions at conferenceamsa at gmail.com. Questions are coming in, so uh, if you do have a question and you want to make sure you get it in, uh, send it to that email address and we'll, we'll do our best to get it in. Um, and so, uh, you know, that first set of questions uh, was really oriented around reflexivity and understanding the self and your engagement with this work. We're gonna shift now to some questions uh, around kind of the theory and the content of, of what you developed in your work mm -hmm. and presentation. And I'm gonna start with a question from an attendee, uh, one of the attendees that was uh, submitted. Um, and they're asking about the, the uh, comment you had around severing mm -hmm. uh, masculinity and biology. So I'll, again, I'll, I'll read the uh, question as it was posed by our uh, attendee. So they write, uh, I want to ask about the proposed strategy of severing the link between biology, manhood, and masculinities as the way forward. While I agree with the general direction proposed in the talk, if masculinities are always embodied and our bodies are shaped by our biology, then it doesn't seem quite right to say that we can simply sever the link. Might it not be better to think about biology in a different way, i.e., in a non-reductionist or deterministic way while acknowledging that the enactment of masculinities are always in some sense going to involve engaging with our biologies. Um, and they finish by just saying, I worry that the call to sever links with biology risks embracing the kind of strong social constructionist position that exacerbates divides with people who hold more restrictive and conservative gender knowledges that are grounded in more materialistic perspectives. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm glad that that um, that someone asked that question. I really appreciate it. The, um, you know, and I'll start off with saying like, biology matters, bodies matter, right? Um, and um, that, um, 
and that actually, I think, you know, um, there are many disagreements and many different perspectives um, on this among trans communities, trans thinkers. Um, but, you know, I think that there's a really, um, trans studies is a really uh, fruitful and productive space for thinking new ways of thinking of like materialities, new ways of thinking about um, biology. Uh, one of the things that I want to, um, what I'm thinking about when I say sever this link is, um, is that, you know, this point when we're always starting there, right? With, but with the primacy of biology, I certainly embrace um, you know, thinking about more non-reductionist or non-deterministic ways of thinking about biology. But I think that to really shift um, our practices as masculinity scholars or in all kinds of fields or in our practice and our politics is by perhaps turning the question of biology into an empirical question, right? So what are the moments when um, biology matters, right? What are the moments when particular embodiments really matter? Um, and I think the, you know, one of the, the points I was trying to make in the talk and I make um, in my book is that, you know, often those, those don't matter, right? Um, that these social experiences that constitute what it is to be a man, what it is to be masculine, although of course they're always linked to notions of biology um, you know, people aren't always looking under people's clothes, or even if they are, they're reinterpreting their bodies in these unexpected ways, right? And Wesley's story, if you listen to the talk, really stands out. Um, you know, when he told me that story, I was like, oh, I think I'm going to be telling this story for a while, right? Um, but his wasn't the only story like that. Um, and so I think that it wasn't just the exception. And so I think that it's really key to... Um, sever that link by flipping the order, right? How do we put um, these common experiences, these common social experiences first? And then, and I think this lesson really comes from, you know, radical reproductive justice movements of how do we even look at bodies as like shared experiences? Um, I know people on the right make fun of this now, right? If we say pregnant people or um, whatever, but I think there's something really, useful um, to have services, to have spaces that can cater to people that have similar kinds of embodiments, right? Um, and um, similar kinds of embodied experiences. And when we start with biology, um, it limits both those, those kinds of shared experiences and then um, understanding these sort of these shared social experiences. Um, so I, you know, of course, my interest in space and place is, again, how how are these constructed, when and where are they constructed in particular ways? Um, I also want to point out that sometimes um, a radical social constructionist perspective can be, is used by sometimes well-meaning people and sometimes not very well-meaning um, people to question um, and limit the access, whether trans people need access to um, aspects of physical gender transition. Um, and uh, and that's a really important thing um, to think about as well, even as I, you know, I certainly tend towards the more radical social constructionist side. And I can also really rec recognize, again, that bodies matter in the ways that, um, you know, uh, the physical transitions are important, sometimes crucial, sometimes life-saving um, for trans people. So we also have to, you know, consider that side of it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. yeah I'll mention I, uh, one of my uh, wonderful mentors, a former president of AMSA and, and just a general wonderful human being, Dr. Robert Heasley, uh, would, would often talk about leaning into that conversation and discussion and critique of biology, right? Not shying away from it as someone who engages mm -hmm. in this work. Um, and part of that is a strategy to make it less concrete, right? To, 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 when, you, when we shy away from it, when we, when we sort of pull away from that conversation, it, it does give um, sort of the other part of the discourse more weight, right? And yeah. it allows, it gives it a bit more standing and we mm -hmm. shouldn't be afraid to think about biology 
but do so in a way that again makes it a little less concrete. And it sounds to me like mm -hmm. you're speaking to and what the question uh, posed are actually maybe making the same argument here, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's not an extreme on either way. It's really it's engaging in a thoughtful, real, and critical way with with the notion of biology and its link to gender as we construct it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And I missed the, the sort of political part of that question at the end, which is that, you know, strategically, yeah, I think it makes sense to, like you said, and your mentor um, said, yeah, en really engage with it, right? Really, we can't pretend that it um, these things don't matter, right? Um, but I think of, I'll share like this really brief anecdote that my wonderful um, department chair and colleague, Lisa Weasel, who's a trained biologist, she's um, feminist and queer science studies. She had a, a peer of, her in the, in the, of hers in the 90s, another feminist scholar say, you know, when you look in a microscope, you have to um, look at the cell as a text and you have to read it as a text. And she kind of laughed and said, yeah, but it's also like the cells there, right? Like I can understand that and you know, we want to like learn some things about cancer. So what do we, how do we kind of bring those together and learn more about, about both? But I think that, um, you know, that, yeah, engaging in it, not shying away from it, having those complicated um, conversations is really key. Mm -hmm. I agree. Thank you. Yeah, I like yeah. That, that framing. It's great. So uh, we had a question come in from an audience member just now that I think actually uh, ties in well with some of what we're discussing. So I'm going to go ahead and ask this one. Okay. Um, they asked or they mentioned, uh, you mentioned in your talk that we need to rethink the category of man to better understand contemporary man and, or men and manhood. Mm -hmm. As a historian, I see this question as being very specific to one particular origin story of typical or traditional conservative normative toxic masculinity. So the question is, how do you read this call to rethink man across history? Mm -hmm. Are there particular before and after moments in history, American history or otherwise, mm -hmm. that you think this field sees as being a particular emphasis in need of re-understanding? Mm -hmm. Happy to repeat yeah. that. Yeah, so, I'm not sure. So thinking historically, um, and I was thinking about this in, in response to one of the other questions, but, you know, I think about um, that this, this sort of very um, solid construction, if, if I'm following the question well, um, the solid construction of man comes from this like particular archetype of um, what we might call a hegemonic, a violent, uh, you know, what have you, masculinity. And I think that, like, the, the historical perspective really speaks to, um, you know, how how unstable that category is, right? And how, um, yeah, it is necessary in certain ways to have that uh, a particular kind of essentialist idea to under underlie um, what we might see in that sort of um, more traditional, uh, conservative or uh, harmful kind of masculinity. Um, you know, I really think about the work of um, Emily Skidmore's book that came out in the last couple of years that looks at, um, I mentioned it maybe in my talk actually, um, that looks at the everyday lives of trans men in um, early 20th century U.S. Um, as one example of thinking about how this category that we think, that's, that some might think was really solidified in the past and was also always under question. Um, you know, and of course I think about something like, um, you know, Maria Lagones's idea of the colonial mo modern gender system to think about the ways that our gender categories are always, you know, are sort of a product of, um, so whether who's a man and who's not is a product of these colonial relationships and um, forms of white supremacy um, historically that we see reflected, um, you know, we still see reflected today. So I'm not sure. So I think that if, if we're going to point to a point in, you know, and again, I'm not a historian, um, so, you know, I'll do my best, uh, is, you know, I think, you know, following Lagones, um, you know, we can see some of the ways that, that 
that sort of colonial system depended on some ways on the, on the solidified category um, and to make others not men, right? So that they could be um, enslaved, so that they could be uh, killed, right? So, so, so that genocide could happen. Um, and maybe this wasn't the, the direction the um, asker was thinking, but, um, uh, you know, I think that that's one of the moments that we can really look to, and others have done work on this, but that we, we can really look to um, when these categories were solidified. And, you know, I just think it's so interesting. Another person whose work um, I think is so important, and it's, it's not necessarily about masculinities, but um, um, Jules Gill Peterson's work on trans kids and the history of trans kids really illustrates the way that we, there's this sort of panic right now about trans kids, but that actually trans kids have existed. You know, we can find examples, written examples in the 1930s, in the, you know, uh, in, you know, throughout the 20th century in the U.S. and other contexts, um, you know, regardless of whether we get into um, thinking about um, non-Western or non-U.S. gender systems that recognize like a multiple genders. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah, so that's my little bit of history or <laughs> response to that. That's a great question. Yeah, I, I'm wondering if you might uh, respond to this as well, you know, and if this resonates, you know, as you were talking about this and I'm thinking about your work broadly around this idea of, of right, how it's spatially situated, right? And there's mm -hmm. this almost tension between these sort of archetypes that, that yeah. exist beyond sort of our spatial sort of situation but they show up in those spaces in different ways, but also maybe carry um, some commonalities, right? Some, mm -hmm. some similarities. And, and there's, uh, right, I think about some work around, uh, right, deep structures versus surface structures and how those archetypes represent these deeper structures that have been ingrained uh, sort of in, in culturally or socially, um, but then the surface structures, uh, right, how those archetypes emerge in particular spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's interesting, right, that, that these disciplines in conversation with each other might come up with different kinds of answers uh, or yeah. different kinds of questions than each of them individually. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it really, you know, one of the animated, one of the things that got me really interested in, um, in studying space and place was thinking about how, um, structural inequalities happen in different spaces. I mean, we can see some differences. They, it looks really different in different places, but we see these same kinds of inequality happening. And I do think that there's, there's that sort of deeper structure um, that is ensuring it. And then you see this local variation, which again, maybe we may, might actually experience as different, um, but has this way of, you know, um, operating, like, you know, and this led me to, to thinking about hybrid masculinities as well, but the way that, you know, we, we engage in sort of surface change or we see surface difference, um, but the underlying relations, and, and I think the historical precedents for them um, are, are shared in certain ways, right? <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, you, you put that much more much more coherently than me. I appreciate. It. <laughs> um, so I want to we're going to shift gears a little bit here, um, but I think it, it it ties to some of what you've been speaking through and and sort of asks the question around how to engage uh, folks across these uh, different gender knowledges. So let me um, sort of reflect back something you said in your talk and then uh, frame the question for you. So. Uh, you, you mentioned in your talk uh, that individuals who had more restrictive or narrow gender knowledges were not necessarily less complex thinkers than those with more expansive knowledges. Uh, you go on to say that is uh, expansive knowledges do not necessarily refer to knowing more, but to knowing differently. Um, you know, I, I, I found this particularly important uh, as it speaks to this dynamic of honoring the lived experience of individuals within the context of the spaces in which they're engaging, right? Mm -hmm. And also the need to engage with those who think differently, right? Or resist more expansive knowledges with, with respect uh, and a sense of genuine curiosity, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you or, or others that are listening might work uh, to do that, to both honor the experience and thinking of those who hold more narrow, restrictive gender knowledges, 
and while also working to expand those those gender knowledges for them. Yeah, that's great. And I, you know, I think about, I particularly was thinking about the classroom with this question, um, thinking about the ways that, um, you know, uh, well, one, I was thinking about, again, like rural, rural students, you know, and I'm in an urban university, as I know you are too, um, of, um, you know, rural students will often come in and they hear, um, you know, uh, rural LGBT students, but I think also we can think about, um, you know, rural students who do masculinities and they see, you know, their, the places they're from sort of demonized um, in many ways of like, okay, this is the source of, of all of this. And, th and that relies on that restrictive gender knowledge. And so I think that um, the thing that, that, that I've realized in my teaching practice is that one of the ways to unseat that is to ask everyone to, let's not just examine the kinds of knowledges that we, you know, um, that come from, that are more narrow restrictive, but let's, um, you know, unpack those expansive knowledges as well and what the effects of them are. Um, because those more expansive knowledges, again, Wesley is a great example of this, you know, he moved to, um, from a, this major um, LGBTQ friendly um, city that has, you know, very expansive notions of masculinity, I think, that are more broadly accepted um, to the rural Southeast, right? In order to avoid this misrecognition that he got from, um, from the more expansive gender knowledges. And so, you know, the more narrow knowledge provided recognition um, that was really crucial for him, you know, to live his life in the way that made sense and also allowed him to play with masculinity in a way that I don't think he would have been, you know, what, what he said to me is he wouldn't have been able to um, in the Bay Area because that recognition was, it wasn't a question of any anymore of whether he was a man or not, it allowed this, this openness. So I think that, um, again, in practice, bringing in those, um, asking everyone to unpack those assumptions and what the kinds of effects of them are um, is really key. Um, and um, and to sort of take on um, the approach of others. And, and a lot of this, I think, and I'm, I'm guessing I'm not the only one here that takes this kind of approach, but, you know, I try to, it varies in, in different courses, but try to take an approach that we're co-creating knowledge in the classroom um, so that, you know, it's not just the banking model, right? I'm not just, I know some things, um, but it's not just me, uh, you know, sort of spewing knowledge that the students will regurgitate. And, um, you know, we also, one of the things that we established along with that, and it, it differs depending on the course, is like a shared commitment to justice for all people. Um, and I, you know, we, we don't define that. That's too much to define in like the first day of a class. Uh, but we, we talk about that. Okay, we're all working towards that um, and, and working towards bettering our world. And I think that allows people um, room to see, um, you know, what, what might be available to them in a more expansive knowledge, um, not just for themselves, but for, for meeting some of those goals around justice and around... Um, bettering people's lives. I also think that, um, be a little cheeky in the afternoon here, um, you know, I mean, I think that some of the things that I teach in a gender studies course, are, they're like a real bummer, right? It's like everything that you know about your gender and, and whatever else is terrible, you know? <laughs> and we have to change everything. And, and like you're taking, you know, it's, it's hard work to, to challenge those taken for granted assumptions. Um, and so, you know, and I'm inspired by, uh, uh, you know, a number of different people on this, but um, I think also to not only see what are the benefits in terms of recognition of these varied kinds of knowledges, but what are the pleasures that we take in gender? Um, you know, it's, um, it's not just this bad thing, right? So like where, how can we create a new knowledge together that has more, is expansive, recognizes um, different ways of being um, so so that Wesley would be recognized as a man, but also allows for pleasure, allows for play, 
um, you know, allows for all those those things together. Feeling very utopian, I think, right now, but. <laughs> I love it. It's good to, good to find those spaces where we can uh, yeah. be celebratory and, and acknowledge joy, right, as well as um, mm -hmm. harms. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I have some other questions that have been coming in around sort of the theory, but I actually want to maybe take a moment to, to continue down this path. Uh, you know, you spend a good deal of time in your talk uh, unpacking some of the ways that we might engage this work as teachers and in the classroom. Um, and, and frankly, we didn't prompt you for that, but uh, I'm so incredibly appreciative. Um, and as you know, and others may know that uh, AMSA really has a, a commitment to creating opportunities for mentorship and professional development, you know, especially for students and early career professionals. And so it was, it was just great uh, to hear you talk about how you translate your scholarship and apply that within the context of your teaching. And so I thought maybe we could explore a few questions around that, uh, and then we can circle back to some of those more theoretical questions uh, if, if we have time towards the end here. So, um, so uh, let's see. Here we go. So thank you. Uh, so <laughs> I'm reading my own question. <laughs> Try that again. So. Uh, you offer an interesting discussion around how your own and others' teaching can be informed and enhanced by adopting and applying an intersectional lens to the teaching of critical masculinity studies. So I'm wondering if you could maybe offer a bit more of what you see as good advice for early career academics who are trying to challenge their students and engage with them in ways that expand their gender knowledges and connect those knowledges across other social positions and identities. Yeah. Um, one of the, you know, one of the go-tos that I have, um, both as a, in my research, in, in my teaching, um, that I use, that I ask my students to use, um, is, comes from Mari Matsuda, who's a um, critical legal scholar, critical race theorist, which I know is a, you know, so we should especially listen to it because it's real critical race theory. Um, you know, and she has this idea to ask the other question. So she'll say, you know, I'm looking at this situation and I can see the sexism in it. So I'm going to ask the other question, where's the white supremacy here? Um, or, you know, see white supremacy in a situation and say, okay, where is the homophobia or heterosexism in this moment? So I think that as a, in teaching as a critical kind of orienting lens, it one leads to, you know, not necessarily, um, well, you know, not necessarily like looking for a boogeyman everywhere, but it allows us to really think like, okay, so if we buy into this idea of intersectionality, which has become a buzzword in a lot of ways, I think there's there's still some resistance um, from students, but I've, you know, in my years of teaching students, it, it's gone from students not knowing what that is to almost every student having some idea of it, right? Um, and again, I, I, I teach in Portland, so that might affect it, but, um, so really coming in with that, which I think one allows us to, as we're looking at these different knowledges, as we're unpacking them to really think about how are they, they co-constructed, how are they co-constituted, how are these systems actually interlocking, right? We could, I also use like Patricia Collins matrix domination is really useful, I think, for that as well. But this ask the other question gives us a really practical tool. Um, so for students in their own thinking, in our classroom discussions, you know, if we start going down in, in kind of a narrow way to pull back and say, okay, well, let's, what are, what are the other questions that we can ask here? Um, and I think that um, I also try and set up my classrooms in a ways that, um, you know, with a discussion about the ways that learning new things and challenging our, our beliefs can be really unsettling. Um, and I sort of ask students to, in the classroom, um, they don't have to change their mind about things, but they have to learn the perspective of the discipline and what, what that lens might provide. Um, and so as part of that, um, I do a lot of reflective work where, um, and it's not necessarily things that students turn in, but asking, um, you know, what kinds of reactions are you having, right? 
Um, so if, if, you know, I could say to people who watch my address, you know, if you're having a reaction to like trans men or men, right. Or, or that, you know, the, um, race, you know, racial difference might be more important or racial similarity might be more important than like a trans cisgender divide. I would say like, okay, let's, you know, let's like recognize what you're feeling and like what's behind that. Right. And what are you invested in? You know, and I ask my students this, like, what, what does this ask you to change about yourself? Because it's not neutral, right? Um, and then um, the other thing I'll say is that for those early career scholars, um, you know, find people who support you in doing this work, um, colleagues, mentors, et cetera. And I think it's a particular, if you're in an institution, it's really important to find people in, in your institution that are going to support you because, you know, there's lots of research that shows that things like course evaluations are really, you know, really biased and, you know, don't really measure necessarily learning. They measure, you know, um, customer satisfaction, but we often don't have better tools and we often can't um, change the institution, especially when we're early in our careers. So, um, you know, having supportive um, department chairs, having supportive people in uh, a dean's office or, or above that know that, you know, you're doing this work that may be challenging to students and that your course evaluations should be, um, and other sort of markers should be taken in, in, into consideration there. Thank you for that. We appreciate both the sort of conceptual thinking about how to engage students, but also the, the concrete on the ground uh, sort of steps that we need to take both individually, but also institutionally and as a field to be thinking about those things. And, mm -hmm. um, put a plug in that we hope that AMSA becomes a space or is a space in which those kinds of advocacy for our members and for others can, can happen, right? So that we can help transform institutions to be more supportive in these ways. Um, I wrote down the question that you asked your students, which I love and I hope others take with them which was, uh, what does this ask you to change about yourself? I think that's such a mm -hmm. great way to reframe the conversation because it's oftentimes that it's, it's a reaction, right? It's not, it's not so much about what it is you're saying, it's about what you're saying in the way that it impacts me and asks me to, to contribute to a solution. Mm -hmm. really yeah, good. and something, sometimes those things are hard to give up and sometimes they're not, you know? Sometimes it's just a, a different, shifting to a different knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. So this question came in from uh, one of our audience members, and I think ties to what we were just discussing. So uh, like like most questions from us uh, yeah. academics, it is a bit of a paragraph. So we'll uh, let me know if you need me to, to reread it. Uh, so one of the things I appreciated about the lecture was the idea of the special guest. So we talk a lot about interdisciplinarity in our field but I'm struck by how committed the field is to the social sciences, and perhaps most especially sociology. For instance, most of the journals and most of the textbooks are edited by sociologists. Perhaps theoretically, at least, I want to ask about diversity and diversifying how we are thinking about masculinities. What is the role of disciplines beyond the social sciences? For instance, what is the role of poetry, the novel, the visual arts, et cetera? Let's solve all the world problems today. I love yeah, that. I'm going to try. I'm going to do my best. Unfortunately, I am a sociologist. So. <laughs> I should have put a, a, a no offense but at the beginning of that question. Oh, oh, that's okay. I can, you know, I can take it. Um, you know, I've always seen my, I mean, this is, you know, me thinking probably more highly of myself than I should sometimes or that I'm more, you know, whatever. But, um, you know, I think I think of myself as a bad sociologist sometimes. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, I'm not, you know, I'm doing negative self-talk here, but um, of the, you know, it's something that I'm really, I really love sociology. I love sociological methods. You know, I have a lot of appreciation for the training that I've gotten in it. Um, and I also am just not a person that's like interested in defending the borders of sociology against other things. I think it's doing fine on its own. Clearly in this, in this subfield, it, or in this in masculinity studies it is. Um, so I think that the, um, 
you know, and I work in an interdisciplinary department and an interdisciplinary field. So I mentioned one of my colleagues, my department chair is a biologist. When I came to the department, it was two people in literature and a philosopher and myself. Um, and that's been really, um, I mean, I did interdisciplinary training as a graduate student and before that as well. Um, and I think that we really lose something of, you know, our sort of spirit of humanity. I mean, to talk in very um, general terms, when we don't incorporate um, poetry, literature, film, um, when everything is through this sort of somewhat empirical lens, although there's difference within that um, in a social science field like sociology. I mean, I think there are spaces, this is part of what attracted me to geography, um, and that I think that in cultural geography, there's a lot, there's more space than in sociology for doing social science inflected work that is very much influenced by cultural studies and humanities. Um, what I think that is needed in general in terms of thinking just about these disciplinary questions and the dominance of one discipline is, um, again, to be able to take the perspective of others, to understand when we're using the language of our discipline, um, of a particular um, discipline, and when and how we can understand the language of other disciplines. Um, you know, I think about, I mean, one example, history kind of straddles um, the social science and humanities. Um, and I had a historian, wonderful historian on my dissertation committee. And she said to me one time, you know, do you really need to have a methods chapter? Um, and, and I was like, yes, the four other sociologists are gonna demand a methods chapter from the sociology PhD. Um, but, you know, one of the lessons that I learned there is like, oh, okay, so like this is, this is another disciplinary perspective. And when I teach, um, I for our School of Gender, Race, and Nation, I teach a critical um, critical and decolonizing methodologies course. Um, as a sociologist, I think I'm well suited to do it because we're really interested in method and, um, and thinking about that. But I've really had to expand the way that I think about methodology, right? In, in the humanities, methodology can be a way of reading. Um, and that I can see that knowledge as um, as valid as you know what I gather from doing um, interviews, right? It's it's a different kind of knowledge, um, and I think that's key as we're training people. Um, so one of the things that I really emphasize in that course, I keep bringing back to teaching, but um, is asking people. There's you know these things that can happen in interdisciplinary graduate courses where people feel like oh I don't know anything, or I mean maybe disciplinary ones too, but. What I, I really demand that, um, or really at, strongly ask that people explain themselves, right? So if they're using terminology, if they're referring to a particular set of theories, um, that they need to explain it to people that aren't from that discipline. Um, and we have, the conversations we have are much more rich. And what I've noticed is it allows me and it allows all of the students to really expand the materials that they're using, the perspectives that they're taking, um, right? So how can we do this more innovative work that actually not just bring, um, you know, more poetry into the sociology journal, but um, ways of thinking about, um, you know, uh, literary analysis and cultural studies that will improve, um, yeah, our thinking in general. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I, I, uh... As an aside, I resonate with your uh, framing of, of bad sociologists. I think I'm, I'm a criminologist, so I think our entire field has been defined by sociology of bad sociology. So that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I'll also put in a gratuitous plug here. Uh, thank you, whoever asked this question. Uh, tomorrow's scholar in residence uh, talk is going to be preceded by a, a poetry performance mm -hmm. by John Gavin White. And so, again, I think an example of where. Um, we need to bring those voices and those ways of knowing into these, uh, what are oftentimes more academic spaces. So I appreciate the response to that question and to the, to the question itself. Mm. You've been really generous with your time. I have a couple more questions if that's okay. Sure. So uh, maybe jump back to um, what I think is, is one of the larger um, sort of goals of your book, I think, as, as I understand it, right? And, and you talk about men in place as, as complicating ideas of rural and urban gender, sexuality, and race, mm -hmm. as well as common notions about the lives of queer and trans people in non-urban spaces. 
Mm -hmm. uh, you, you teased this out quite a bit in your talk, and I'm just wondering if you wanted to take some time to expand on that and deepen your, uh, your conversation around that. So I think it's a really important uh, takeaway from the work that you're doing. Yeah, th yeah. thanks for, for bringing that back in. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that, um, and this was part of unlearning my own gender knowledges, my gender sexual racial knowledges, and growing um, as a researcher and thinker was, um, is, was doing sort of rural LGBTQ research, um, pushing past the assumptions. And, you know, I got lots of questions from, um, you know, various people. How can you even, even find people? They're, they're going to be a needle in a haystack. Um, and just thinking like, well, no, I think, I think they exist. I, I've seen the documentary Southern Comfort, which is a wonderful, the tra tragic documentary. Um, uh, I said, okay, I, you know, I think, I think this, this exists and, you know, where that led me, um, in unpacking those ideas about rural spaces that are so predominant, we call it, you know, the metro normative narratives of, um, of queer life, of queer politics, of queer studies, that's really premised on an urban, a rural to urban, uh, migration. Um, and that it's, uh, you, you can't live a livable queer life um, in rural spaces. Uh, there are lots of scholars that have done work, um, you know, upsetting those narratives, like Scott Herring's um, Queer Anti-Urbanism, Mary Gray's work in rural Kentucky. Um, but the, the, the thing that surprised me um, is that where this really led in a lot of ways was thinking about, um, you know, how, how starting to unpack my ideas about rural spaces led me to understand things like the takeover of the mall here, National Wild Ref, Wildlife Refuge here in Oregon, um, Eamon Bundy, you know, part of the Bundy family. If people aren't familiar with that. Um, and the ways that ideas about ruralness are employed by those political activists um, to bolster their cause, right? Um, that they take on this sort of working class, rural ideal, um, and in a way that I think really um, corrupts it. And I think that as I spoke to really briefly in the in my talk, um, you know, we can also see these ideas of ruralness. Um, you know, there there are many ways we can see masculinity in the insurrection on January six. Um, but I think that um, it, you know, allowed me to unpack ideas about, you know, uh, saying that, okay, this is all people from the country, right? This is all people from rural spaces. Um, and then that's where, you know, that's where our problem is. Um, and, you know, I think that asking those deeper questions, not only about queer life, but about masculinities, um, you know, more broadly, how these images of masculinity allow us again to like distance ourselves from blame. And I don't, um, you know, separate myself from that either, right? Mm -hmm. um, at the same time that, you know, black masculinity is so punished, um, you know. So I think that, yeah, those are some of the ideas that, you know, I mentioned it really briefly in the talk, but I speak to it in the book. Um, quite a bit more. And then in some of my newer work, which is looking at, um, as I mentioned, like rural Idaho and Eastern Washington, but also looking at the far right movements in those areas and how, um, you know, they take often rural communities that typically exist in a more live and let live kind of way um, and may valorize particular aesthetic forms of masculinity. Um, but um, were more livable in the past. And you have this migration happening to that area that um, where people think, oh, this is a conservative wonderland and I can you know, do all of my awful sexist, racist, um, transphobic, et cetera, behavior here, um, which really changes those rural communities as, as places where people could live. And at the same time, of course, not to make it, you know, I haven't said neoliberalism yet, so I don't think so. I'll say that <laughs> in the same ways that we've really, um, you know, rural communities have really suffered um, under neoliberalism, have really been hollowed out um, as, as a number of people write about. So I think that, um, you know, some of you uh, live in rural communities, um, you know, others, you know, are likely to live in urban, urban or suburban spaces. And I think that the thing that I just want to emphasize is that, 
there's a really important form of solidarity um, that needs to happen between those spaces. So when we're thinking about men and masculinities, certainly LGBTQ issues, but just um, thinking about our general, um, our, our research and our political commitments as well. That's something I really learned. Thank you so much. Yeah. You've earned back your uh, sociological bona fides because you did you did get neoliberalism back in there. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know, we're, we're just about out of time. I want to ask what I think are two uh, more fun questions. Uh, mm -hmm. You can feel free to answer one, both, or if you'd prefer not to answer either, that's perfectly fine. Okay. So the first is, uh, you know, this has been and continues to be a difficult time uh, across a, a lot of different uh, aspects of our lives. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I'm curious, what brings you joy these days? What What mm -hmm. is it that you celebrate? And, and this ties back to some of your points earlier around making time to, to embrace joy and celebration. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the second one is, what's what's a, you know, a piece of popular culture, movie, book, mm -hmm writer that you're engaging with at the moment that you'd love for others to sort of explore and think about? Mm -hmm. um, those are wonderful questions to end with, and I love thinking about them. Uh, things that bring me joy right now are um, my garden. Um, you know, seeing the, there's something about um, planting bulbs, you know, in a time that we had to plant our bulbs last fall. Um, and you know, there's a lot of hope in that. Um, there's a lot of hope in planting the tomato plants and the cucumbers and whatever. And so I'm just feeling a lot of, we're going to have a little heat wave, so I'm a little worried about things. But seeing the bulbs come up this year, I did a layered bulb pot, um, which I don't know if you know, but bulb lasagna is the other name of it. Um, and it just worked, I, which was inspired by Monty Don, who's a British gardener, who has a show called Gardener's World. Um, and that was just, just absolutely brought me joy. And then, um, you know, through vaccination, um, being able to hug friends again is the other thing that in some families, the, the thing that is bringing me joy. Um, I've been watching two very different um, pop culture things right now, um, but I think there's something to be learned from both of them. And so the first one is uh, RuPaul's Drag Race, which has its problems, um, but is very fun and it like, some seasons of it coincided with like when I was in graduate school and pre-tenure and so I didn't watch a lot of it so I've gotten to like catch up and I was like oh that's those, that's the lingo that my students were using like five years ago <laughs> now I understand what they're saying um and the other one is the show alone which is yeah it's really I mean it's it's int really interesting you know so in the show people go um and are alone in some wild place in the Arctic, Vancouver Island in the Pacific Northwest, and they have to survive as long as possible, you know, with a few tools and their wits, and they, they're totally alone. Um, and so, I mean, they're just really, really interesting things that happen. Um, I'm always thinking about gender, of course, and sexuality, and I think both shows, like, next to each other really offer a lot, so, yeah. Thank you so much for, for playing long while I sprung those questions on you. Um, <laughs> those are great. I, I can't tell you how appreciative we are that you agreed to come back. You were you were going to be our uh, speaker last year and be postponed, and it was such a great gift that you were willing to come back and engage with us in this way. Uh, your work is a gift to the field and, and uh, to the continued critical study of men and masculinities. Uh, folks who are listening, if you haven't yet had a chance to read Men in Place, Transmasculinity, Race, and Sexuality in America, please go out and get it. And better yet, if you attend AMSA in person next year, we'll give you a free copy. Uh, so please join us next year. Um, join me. It's awkward. We can't see anyone. But uh, I imagine there's lots of folks out there smiling and clapping uh, and in deep appreciation for your comments today, your talk, and the work that you do. Thank you so much. Uh, we wish you all the best. Uh, as you move forward. Yeah, and thank, thank you, and thank you all um, for listening today. I really enjoyed this conversation and being a part of this. Thank you all. Have a lovely night.